Every year, over 12,000 people pass away without leaving a will, and seemingly with no next of kin. But often there is a distant relative who stands to inherit, and that's where the air hunters come in. On today's programme, the air hunters are left scratching their heads when they struggle to solve a mystery where a woman has passed away, leaving tens of thousands of pounds. I'm going grey here on this case today. An estranged family come to terms with their mother's secret past and discover relatives they never knew existed. It's unbelievable that somebody can completely guillotine a relative and have absolutely nothing to do with her. And we'll have details of some of the hundreds of unclaimed estates. Could you be in line for a windfall? In the UK, about two-thirds of people do not have a will and therefore leave no record of their last wishes. If they die and leave an estate and an obvious relative cannot be found, then the money automatically defaults to the government, who last year made £18 million in unclaimed estates. There are over 12,000 cases of unclaimed estates in the UK every year and over 30 companies make it their business to track down the rightful heirs and put them in touch with a fortune they never knew existed. With so much money at stake and working for a commission, it's a lucrative business, and therefore, competition can be fierce. It's not going to beat me. I refuse to let it beat me. Fraser and Fraser have been air hunting for almost a century and have handled over £100 million worth of inheritance in the last 10 years alone. The team leave no stone unturned in their search for the heirs to unclaimed fortunes. It's 7am on Thursday morning and one of the busiest times of the week. Every Thursday, the Treasury released the Bona Vacantia, a list of the UK's unclaimed estates. In the highly competitive probate research business, it's a race against time to work out which estates are valuable and worth further research. The team at Fraser & Fraser have directed their attention towards one case in particular. Company boss Neil Fraser is assessing its value. It's a case of... Eames, uh, Beatrice May Eames, uh, maiden name Mansell. In this case, we, we'd identified uh, an address which was a nursing home. I then have a, another look at that list again, identified an older address where she appeared to have moved out, and it would appear that she does still own the property. It's not a hugely valuable property in Birmingham. Building site, one side of the road, probably in the 80 to £90,000 mark. This estimated value makes the case still worth investigating. So Alan, one of the team's senior researchers, gets straight to work. The team have very little information to go on, so they use census, birth, death and marriage certificates to build a family tree for the deceased. Going back generations and generations, the team hope to uncover potential heirs to an estate. Beatrice May Ems passed away in Birmingham in July 2009. She left a house which is estimated to be worth around £80,000, which means it could be a relatively lucrative case for the air hunters. Beatrice married Bertie Ems in 1944, and they had a son, David. Sadly, Beatrice was widowed in 1977. David continued to live with his mother until he too passed away in 2001. Beatrice worked in the local shop and could often be seen out with her beloved corgis and basset hounds. When Beatrice's health took a turn for the worse, she was admitted to a nursing home where she spent the last eight years of her life. Senior manager David Pacifico thinks he might have enough research to start putting together an extensive family tree. I thought the deceased may have been one of about eight children. And it's all local as well. If we're correct about this, we've got potentially the deceased birth in Wensbury, which is West Midlands, and her mother's maiden name being Webb. So we've done a search for Mansell to Webb, and we've found seven or eight other possible siblings that are deceased. And we've now come up with an account address of one of the siblings. So we could have a brother, at least one brother being alive. I want to go and find it through. But before Dave can pick up the phone, Alan has an update for him. He's found another marriage of a Beatrice May Ems, which would give them a much earlier date of birth than they previously thought. Percy S.C. Ems. In 1944. Oh, this is wrong. So I think this is wrong. Yeah, but if she marries in 44, we've got the wrong birth. Not too easy, to say the least. The trouble was, there were two Ems married to Mansells. 
Um, we've got the wrong Emster Mansell, which means we've got the wrong birth of the deceased. So we now think we've got the right deceased marriage, and therefore that she's older, much older than what we thought. So she's born about 1919. So we're now checking on her parentage and brothers and sisters. Sadly, Dave has been barking up the wrong tree, and all his hard work so far is now destined for the bin. Time to start again. Right, this is the names of the... Oh, right, Beatrice May Mansell, we think, was born in September 1919 in Dudley. Right? The deceased had a son called David. He died in 2001. After a couple of full starts, they seem to be back on the right track. We've got two possible marriages for the deceased son. Paul was doing an inquiry, and I want to bring, brief him up to date on this so far. It's time to call upon the expertise of the travelling air hunters. Throughout the UK, Frasers have a team of researchers on standby who are able to hit the road at a moment's notice. Their job is to track down vital clues and information on the case and eventually sign up the rightful heirs. They have to work fast, as a rival air hunting company is never far behind. Pleased to meet you. Paul Matthews is based in the Midlands, so he's the first port of call for Dave, who needs to firm up his speculations on the Beatrice May Ems case. Right, we've got some information. It looks like everything seems to be coming out of Dudley. Oh, right. Dave needs Paul to use his local contacts and put in a call to Dudley Register Office to find out the details on Beatrice's death certificate. Although they will need the physical certificate later, the information conveyed over the phone gives them a head start. And the informant? The informant was her niece, Linda Mary Power. That's probably her niece on um, the late husband's side, I would think. Yeah. Otherwise she'd be entitled, wouldn't she? Yeah. OK, that's great. Thank you very much for your help. Paul immediately relays this update back to Dave. Good morning, Frank and Fraser. Yeah, Paul Matthews after Dave P, please. Thank you. Hello, Paul. Hi, Dave. Right, um, get your pen poised. It's not the outcome Dave expected. She was born 22 to 1923. 1923? Yeah. Right, the date of birth of the deceased is not one that we had before. She was born 1923. So I'm going to start all over again now. It's 9.30am and they're back to square one. Before you know for certain when she's born, there could be several potential births for the deceased, which we had in this case. Now we've got the death certificate. It shows the date of place of birth, which we've looked up, and we've now confirmed it's correct. So the question now is to confirm her parents and confirm whether or not they had any other children and so forth. It has been a frustrating morning, but at least now the team can work from a definite date of birth. Meanwhile, Paul heads to Beatrice's street. The neighbours might be able to shed some light on this case. Sorry to bother you. Make some quarries about the old lady who stood next door, Beatrice. Anyone around here who she used to know well who might be able to help us? Any friends or family or...? Made some inquiries at the, the neighbours' houses. Uh, the house itself, it's, uh, it's obviously not occupied. Uh, I think I've found out it is actually owned by the lady. Um, the neighbours seem to think there's family out at Stetsford, a lady called Linda, so at least we put a value on it. We know there's a property which is probably worth over £100,000, so it's an estate which we will look at. OK. The informant on the death is Linda Powers. She's Beatrice's niece, but by marriage and therefore not entitled to the estate. They knew one another well, especially in the latter part of Beatrice's life. No, not since I was a child. I used to go and have cups of tea with her and that. I used to go and visit her in the shop where she used to work. So we've always been in Betty's life. <laughs> Had a down here for meals. Tea, Christmas, and she'd eventually on her own. Uh, just always been there in my life. Yeah. Well, I've just pulled up outside Birmingham Register Office. Paul's arrived at the Birmingham Register Office. It's already 10 a.m., so he has no time to waste. I'm going to move on anyway because I want to get in there. Okay, Dave. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Any delays give the competition an advantage. Paul is collecting the birth and marriage certificates of Beatrice. Well, this is what we've been waiting for. Yeah, Paul Matthews after Dave P, please. 22nd of February 1923. Beatrice May. Father Bert James Mansell. The mum was Kathleen May Mansell, formerly Pierce. Beatrice's parents were Albert James Mansell and Kathleen May Pierce. Their only daughter Beatrice married Bertie Ems and they had one son, David. 
Knowing that Beatrice was an only child and David had no children of his own, the team must now look for cousins. Back at the office, another researcher, Gareth, is brought in to assist Dave. He gets to work on the information that Paul has just called in. They've just got the names of the parents of the deceased, which are Bert James and Kathleen May. So I'm seeing if I can find a death for them um, so we can establish when they're born, because it looks like the deceased is an only child, in which case we need to go back to cousins. Uh, but so far, I haven't found anything yet. While Gareth tries one approach, Dave thinks he's found a lead on the marriage certificate of Beatrice's parents. One of the interesting things on the marriage is the witness, which we're looking at. Two witnesses called Grigg, Back in the... Richard G. Grigg <laughs> and a Florence H. Grigg. Possibility, could it be a married aunt? It's Florence H. Pierce. So Florence, yeah. The sister of the mother, who was Florence H. Pierce, marries a Richard G. Grigg. I often find that witnesses very often are relatives and I thought, I'm hoping it might be a married sister, what it is. We now need to know if she's got any children. Gareth's already on to it. We've done an issue search from that. It doesn't look like they've any kids. Um, certainly not in England and Wales. If it's just the two of them, Florence, uh, Florence and Kathleen, then it's going to be a dead side of the tree. William Walter Pierce married Rose Grimes and they had two daughters, Kathleen and Florence. Florence married Richard Grigg, but they had no children. Beatrice was the daughter of Kathleen, and after marrying Bertie, they had one son, David. Although he married Barbara Kelly, they had no children. This means there are no living relatives on the maternal side of the tree. If there are any living heirs, they are on her father's side. At the moment, we're having difficulty trying to identify the birth of the father and any census on that side, since according to his marriage, he's supposed to be born about 1896. Um, and the Berts or the Elberts that we found don't match the year when you're supposed to be born, unless he lied about his age on his marriage. So it's not coming out as quickly as I would have hoped, you know. Kathleen May. Later on Air Hunters, the mystery deepens. This is unbelievable. How on earth did she register her mother's death as a widow of Edward Mansell? <laughs> you tell me. Air Hunters can be found all over the UK and the search for a rightful beneficiary can take them anywhere. Celtic Research is run by Peter and Hector Birchwood from their offices in Wales and London, and their regional case managers work from home. Phil is an associate genealogist and has been working from the peace and quiet of his back garden in Wales for the last few years. Celtic Research is renowned for solving unsolvable cases. We don't give up on cases because of the interest, the intrigue, the buzz of, of investigation. I don't ever think that a case is unsolved or unsolvable. Phil is used to painstaking research, but few cases have tried his patience and dedication quite as much as that of Nancy Elizabeth Garner. It has been a 16-year search to find the rightful heirs. Nancy Elizabeth Garner died in 1991 in Northamptonshire, aged 80, without leaving a will. She left behind an estate worth in excess of £50,000. Nancy married William in 1941. They had no children and she outlived her husband. She was well known in her local community of Bugbrook and was looked upon as a friendly eccentric. She just arrived here and uh, at the house there, which I used to deliver the mail to, but I mean, it just arrived and that was it, you know. I don't know where she came from or any of a background. Yeah. We, we, we assume that she was Welsh um, because she always retained an accent. She also went around on a little motorbike, which was something for her, really. Very surprising, but um, she was very friendly, always. You didn't see her with anyone else? No. She was always scuttling about on her own? She was just, just there, yeah. mm. Mrs G. Yeah. In the beginning, we get the date of death. On, on each case, and we, as normal, we, we order the death certificate. From the death certificate on the Nancy Garner case, we found we were given a date of birth, and her maiden name was Davies. Unfortunately, after looking through, exhausting all inquiries on every record we could find, she didn't exist. After such an early setback, it looked as though this would be an impossible case to solve. That is until a change in law ten years later. The introduction of the Freedom of Information Act offered Celtic Research a breakthrough in 2007. 
We wrote and asked through the Freedom of Information Act for more information on Nancy Elizabeth Davies, and we got a letter back that showed us that she was actually born two years earlier and in a workhouse illegitimately, and we worked from there. With this new information and a different date of birth, Phil was able to piece together Nancy's story much more easily. He soon discovered that Elizabeth Ann Davies gave birth to her daughter Nancy illegitimately in Ponta Derby Workhouse on the 3rd of March 1911. To find out more, Phil had to travel to the Swansea archives, where he was granted special permission to search the records for more clues and to verify what he had been told. This is the register that confirmed that we're on the right track in this case. And it mentions that a single woman named Elizabeth Ann Davies was delivered of a female child, which then confirmed that the birth that we had, the 3rd of March 1911, was correct, and we had found the, found the child. In the early part of the century, the workhouse was where people went when they were unable to support themselves financially. By the 1830s, uh, the bill for dole uh, out relief across the country was reached epic proportions. So the government decided that something had to be done. And the workhouse had been around for a while, and it was decided that the workhouse would become the only option if you were destitute, and out relief, dole, was going to just be abolished. By the early 1900s, um, in one sense, the, the physical conditions in the workhouse had actually improved quite a bit from, sort of Charlie, from Oliver Twist and, and Gruel and, 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 and that picture. But the thing that hadn't changed is this really great shame that was attached to the workhouse. Um, you know, you really had to be desperate uh, to consider going into one. Maybe the fact that she was illegitimate, the workhouse was the most appropriate place to go and less, less publicised. Records show Nancy's mother returned to the workhouse a second time to give birth to another daughter, Frances. From Phil's research, it seems that the sisters lived in the workhouse until their mid-teens until Nancy was offered a way out. This is the entry where we found on October the 15th, 1926, that she had been taken to, to Northampton Hospital by the matron. There is no mention of her being ill, so we take it that she was taken there for service. Moving on from 1926, if I, when I looked further, we find that Frances May Davis is taken to Northampton Hospital by the matron or service, so she's gone to join her sister. Being taken into service meant that the girls left the workhouse for good and began working as domestic maids. We took a chance and um, looked for marriages in Northampton and we found the rest of the story. At the register office in Northampton, Phil uncovered the sisters' marriages. Nancy's to William Garner and Frances to Albert Ellis and then a second marriage to Cheslaw Gralak. But did Frances's two marriages produce any children? If they did, they would be heirs to Nancy's estate. So it's a matter of trying to the easiest route first, which was the Gralak. Well, even though Gralak being an unusual name, there were a few of them. And I couldn't really pin down exactly who, who was who. But I did find, searching through the, on the internet, this person called John Gralak, and uh, I gave him a ring. And he happened to be the right person. He was the son. I was over the moon. All the hard work had now panned out. We'd actually solved the case. John Gralak is 52 years old and a professional musician living in Manchester. Phil from Celtic Research contacted me and um, said he'd been looking for me for nearly 10 years, which was a big shock, um, and said that uh, I'd possibly got an auntie, which, uh, which I obviously never knew anything about. This auntie um, was my mother's sister, and in, in all my upbringing, it was, she was never, ever mentioned, and I never knew she existed at all. So, yeah, big shock. Phil's revelations about Francis and his aunt Nancy's upbringing echoed John's own childhood and his difficult relationship with his mother. It was very strict and everybody knew what they were supposed to be doing, where they're supposed to be. Like many of her generation, the strict institutionalised experience in the workhouse made it difficult for Francis to later form emotional bonds with her own children. I cut myself off totally and I lived on my own, basically in a room when I was young. Um, I used to go downstairs and get my meals, and I used to go upstairs. And um, basically, I was on my own most of my childhood. 
Although John grew up without siblings, he had vague memories of having a half-brother and sister. When Phil investigated this, he discovered David and Christine, Francis's children from her first marriage to Albert Ellis. Although Francis was just as secretive with her other children as she was with John, and never revealed to Christine or David that she had a sister, Nancy. My mother never mentioned uh, Nancy at all. I didn't even know I had any aunties. I am shocked. I still can't get my head around it. It's really, you know, knocked me back. Because I wouldn't like to have met her. You know, to know I'd got another part of the family, it would have been nice. It's unbelievable that somebody can go through, the, through their life and, um, and completely guillotine a relative and have absolutely nothing to do with her whatsoever. It's, uh, it's astonishing, really. It seems that Christine's relationship with her mother was as difficult as John's. When I was quite young, my mother and dad divorced. When, how old I was, I don't really know. And she left me and my brother David with my dad. And every now and again, we used to go and stop with my mother. So my dad brought me up till I was 16. And David was 17 or 18. And then I just left there and went over to live with my mother. She did have a loving personality about her, but she was very, very strict. Um, when she used to go out shopping, she used to leave me to do the housework. And if she left me young brother, John, with me, she used to come back and ask him if uh, I'd had my radio on. And if I did, she used to turn the house upside down and make me clean it again. I did leave home a, few, a couple of times and when I lived with a friend, left for about a week at a time, and went, then went back. But she was really, really strict. You had to, you know, you, I was really nervous when living with her. But while her time in the workhouse had a strong influence on her in later life, Amazingly, Frances never told her children that this was where she had grown up. I, I didn't realise my mother was actually brought up in the workhouse. Um, all I remember is the fact that I, I knew that she was orphaned from, from birth um, and that she was in domestic service um, later on in life, and that's really all I remember. It could be that's why she was so strict, because of the life she had when she was younger. Coming up, John visits a workhouse to help him understand his mother's secret past. My mother was tough and I think she had to be to survive. I look at it in a very different light now. For every case that is cracked, there are still many thousands which remain a mystery. These cases sit on the Treasury's unsolved list and can remain there for up to 30 years. The estates can range wildly in value from £5,000 to many millions, with the rightful heirs completely unaware of the windfall they could claim. Today, we've got two cases air hunters have so far failed to solve. Could you have the answer? Could you be in line to inherit? Robert Wardle from Chertsey in Surrey passed away in May 2006. To this day, nobody has come forward to claim his estate. Does this name mean something to you? Can you offer a clue that might solve the case? Jean Nanette Mackenzie from Rochester died in Kent in July 2006, leaving no will, and seemingly with no next of kin. Could she be a distant relative? Might you stand to inherit her estate? It's 11.40 a.m. and it's back to the drawing board at Fraser & Fraser. The search for heirs to Beatrice May M's £80,000 estate is not going to plan. Paul is in the Birmingham Register office collecting the death certificate of Beatrice's mother. But rather than offer clues, it only seems to confuse matters. It's a little bit out on age, but only a couple of years, so I thought initially it was wrong, especially when I saw it said the widow of Edward Mansell. We're looking for... Kathleen May Pierce, who's married to an Albert James. Um, but the things that proves it is the right person is uh, our informant is our deceased, Beatrice Ems, of the same address. So, yeah, that is the right death. But um, so there's a bit of a question now about Mr Mansell's actual name. The team thought Beatrice's father was Albert Mansell, but Paul has found an Edward Mansell named on Beatrice's mother's death certificate. They must be the same man, Beatrice's father, but he has used two different forenames over his lifetime, Albert and Edward. Paul wastes no time in calling through to Dave and updating him on the discovery. David Pacifico, I have Paul Matthews for you on 619. 
Paul Hello, Paul. Kathleen May Mansell, widow of Edward Mansell. Widow of Edward? Why Edward? Now, it is right. Don't, don't panic. I'm, I'm going grey here on this case today. And the informant is B BMM's... This is unbelievable. How on earth did she register her mother's death as a widow of Edward Mansell? <laughs> you tell me. But the key question is whether Albert and Edward are the same person. This is a testing situation, and until they get the answer, they cannot complete a family tree on the father's side. A lot of hard work, and so it's frustrating not getting anywhere. Um, but the only thing is, if, if we're struggling and it's hard to work up, then it's going to be the same for our rival companies. So even though we're getting nowhere fast at the moment, we're plugging away at it, but our competitors will also be having the same problems, hopefully. It's not going to beat me. Refuse to let beat me. Despite inconsistent names for Beatrice's father on certificates, all other names and dates are consistent. So the team now work off the assumption that Bert, Albert and Edward are in fact the same person. They desperately need a date of birth for Beatrice's father to secure the family tree. So far, they've been unable to locate an appropriate date of birth for an Albert or an Edward Mansell. But finally, Gareth has an explanation. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That was Gareth telling me he's found a birth um, entry of an Edward James Mansill, M-A-N-S-I-L-L, -L, in March quarter 1896 in Birmingham, which could be the father's birth, and therefore Edward in it. So at one time he called himself Bert, another one time Edward, so now it makes more sense. Hello. Uh, Paul, listen, we may have resolved the birth of the father. Oh, right, thanks. Details of an Edward James Mansill, M-A-N-S-I-L-L. -L. This is where the Edward comes in. Oh right. Yeah, I've got the uh, I've got the actual entry. It's down as Edward J Mansill. After hours of painstaking research, the team's confusion over the father's name had hung upon a spelling mistake on the surname Mansell, made decades ago. I was taking my hair out two hours ago. Um, it was it's so much sort of confusion and names changing and all sorts. Thanks to some good research work, we've been able to hopefully identify the family now. So, With the mystery of Beatrice's father solved, Dave and Gareth can confidently start the family tree again. What does it say on 1911? How many children? The 1911 census reveals Edward, also known as Albert, had a brother Leonard and a sister, Doris. Now the team need to see if there were any more siblings born after 1911. If any of these siblings went on to have children, they could be potential heirs. I found what could be another aunt of the deceased, um, a winner for Jay Mansell. I want to get Paul to check that out. Meanwhile, we're working on children of an uncle, Leonard Mansell. The team discover three siblings for Edward, Leonard, Doris and Winifred. Doris died in her early 20s, but Leonard married Elsie Wedgbury and Winifred married Alfred Greenock. Since Leonard and Winifred are now deceased, any subsequent children they might have would be in line to inherit part of Beatrice's estate. Good detective work has led Gareth to a potential heir living in the Midlands. Um, hopefully we've got Audrey now. She's going to be first cousin of the deceased and I'm going to give her to David and hopefully a phone her. Um, hang on, I've got Gareth there. She's in Solihull. Well, it, hopefully in Solihull if it's right. Right. Yeah. Just um, going back on this... Audrey Dory may still be alive living in Solihull. Oh, well, hang on a second. She's getting on a bit. She'll be, she was born in 26. So she's Audrey Dory. This is coming straight from the horse's mouth. OK. Now, if that's right, she's a first cousin. Hopefully we'll be the answers to a few questions here. Thanks, Paul. Bye. With this revelation, Paul is straight off to pay Audrey a visit. The team are hoping she will be able to confirm their findings. If so, she would be entitled to inherit a share of Beatrice's £80,000 estate. Paul hopes to sign her up immediately before any rival companies also track her down. Tell me what's what, what brought all this to life. Because somebody's passed away, they haven't made a will. Yeah. Left a sum of money. Oh, I see. Now that sum of money is either going to go to the government. Yeah. Or, or and to the family. To the family. Yeah, I'm which with is, you. Which is why now mm. we're trying to find out what you know about your dad's brothers and sisters. I mean, it's not normally this up in the air whereby we no. don't know. I know my dad's sister. Her name was Winifred. Yeah. Her name was Winifred. There was a Doris who passed away as a young young lady. Yes. Um, and we think there was an Edward or an Albert. There was a Bert. Bert. I remember Bert, yes, Uncle Bert, yeah, I can remember him. Was Bert married? Yes, he was married, yeah. 
Did he have children? Oh, dear me. No, I couldn't tell you. You're going back such a long time. I know, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And the older you get, the, the less you can so talk about. I can't remember now. But Audrey's memory is still strong. She had a sister, Joan, and a brother, John. Joan married Henry, and they had one child, who would be an heir. John married Barbara, and they too had one child, who also stands to inherit. Winifred had children also, who could be heirs. As well as confirming the team's research on the family, she can recall an Uncle Stanley. He married Beryl, but did he have children, and could there be more heirs to chase? Fraser's are very keen to sign them up as soon as possible. Isn't it amazing how you can go, you know, so far back and find out there's no hiding place, is there? <laughs> well, no, it's... Uh, I hope it all works out so OK, cos you yeah. might get a few more out of this, you know. Oh, well, that'd be interesting. The team have managed to contact Audrey's cousin Margaret, another potential heir. As the day is drawing to a close, they have arranged to meet her the next morning. 16, 14... As she's based near Bradford, local travelling air hunter Dave Mansell is able to pay her a visit and potentially sign her up. Well, what I'm going to do now is just go through your family yes. uh, in order so that we tie you to the deceased. Yes. What is your full name? Margaret Valerie Griffith. But your mum's siblings, your aunts and uncles My now. Aunts and uncles. I want I want you to tell me about them now. There was Bert and Leonard, who I think were in the twenties when my mother was born. So my mother was brought up right. with her nephews right and nieces. He was Edward James Mansell. Right. Otherwise Albert James Mansell. Otherwise Bert James Mansell. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's coming out, it's coming out. But he, we never knew anything about him or his family. Well, maybe that's why, if he's changed his name. And, but there was my Uncle Len, who we, and my yeah. Auntie Elsie, that we used to visit. So and no details about him whatsoever? None whatsoever. My mother no, never talked about him. Which is odd. Well, there'll be a reason. Yes. There always is. Oh, yes, yes. What about Doris? Doris died, I think, when she was a child. Well, she was 24. Well, there you go, you see. <laughs> Margaret has been able to complete the tree. She has confirmed the team's findings, but also been able to account for Stanley's children, who will also be heirs to Beatrice's estate. Lovely to have Thank met you. Thank you for coming. That's been a pleasure. Really interesting. It's been a worthwhile visit for Dave. The company will help Margaret submit her claim to part of Beatrice's estate. It's, it's something that you don't expect, you know, especially when it's such so close in the family. Um, yes, although my mother always... You know, said that there was somebody in the cupboard somewhere. The research was a proper piece of detective work and uh, it's good when that comes together. We're the first people to contact them, all the beneficiaries and uh, from there we've got um, all the uh, agreements in. So I think there's eight beneficiaries in total and they're split between the three stems. So I'm pretty pleased with the outcome. Earlier, we were looking into the case of Nancy Elizabeth Garner. Phil at Celtic Research revealed to Nancy's niece and nephews that their mother and aunt were brought up in a Welsh workhouse. It could be that's why she was so strict, because of the life she had when she was younger. To help him empathise better with his mother's upbringing, John has come to the Rochdale workhouse to meet historian Peter Higginbotham. Hey John. Hello, nice hello Peter. You. Nice to meet you. Sir. I think we're not nice basically found ourselves today. We so uh, certainly have. It's actually been the Rochdale workhouse, and uh, I think it's you know, on the way it's been closed down. But it's really a, you know, a grim building. I'm just trying to imagine what it would have been like here, you know, 100 years ago. It's really quite depressing, I think. Why were the workhouses here then? In, in... Well, and why were people put into the workhouses? That, that's a very good question. Well, the first thing to say is people weren't put into workhouses. It's probably true to say people resorted to the workhouse when they had no other option. Now, there wasn't a National Health Service. Mm. The only option you had if you needed medical care was the workhouse infirmary. And a particular group of people who came to use the workhouse infirmary were pregnant women, poor pregnant women. My mother was born in the workhouse and spent most of the So what sort of life would she have... Well, if you were born in the workhouse, the um, then I guess we would probably say you, know, you, you, you became institutionalised from quite an early age. I mean, for children, um, there was uh, at least three hours of school a day. That was required by the regulations. Mm -hmm. Most workhouses also gave what was called industrial training, things like uh, agricultural work, shoemaking, 
carpentry, uh, plumbing. My father went into, into domestics, so, so obviously yeah. uh, scrubbing floors. Yes. And, um, obviously was well, if you were a girl, uh, a teenage girl in the workhouse, that would be the most likely uh, place that you would end up. Right. Well, we've dug up some pictures of the, the Ponte oh, right. um, workhouse. Now, as you can see, it's on a rather smaller scale than this place. So where would my mother have been in, the, in this, in this Ponte Dowie? Um, well, there would have been a women's half and a men's half. Um, I'm not actually sure which one was which in, in Ponte Dowie. Um, the way you can always tell is where the laundry was. So if you pin down the laundry, <laughs> that was the women's side, because right. the women did the laundry work. There would have been a subsection for elderly women and a subsection for able-bodied women. It's certainly in a very institutional sort of um, style. Oh, um, yeah. um, as you can see, these dividing walls are um, cutting up the, um, the grounds. It's real segregation, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's, it's sometimes said workhouses were machines for segregating people. That's the, the main essence of a workhouse design, is to compartmentalise people. So. Emotionally, how yeah. do you think people were affected by being in the workhouse? Because mm. my own feeling is that... I, I, don't, I think my, my, emotional, my mother was probably emotionally... Uh, crippled. I don't think, on the whole, um, there was much affection shown for children in the workhouse. I mean, even, you know, even with quite caring staff, it probably you know, was seen, it would have been seen as unfair, actually, to, to, you know, certainly for teachers and, and for the matron to have favourites. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you broke the rules, you, you would have a spell uh, you know, on bread and water or, or in a, a cell, a refractory cell, it was called, you know, for 24 hours. So you probably you know, wanted to keep on the straight and narrow on the whole unless you were a bit of a rebel. Um, but certainly emotionally, I think, yes, I'm sure people lacked affection, you know, which I think you know, we'd all say these days was a key thing in making people you know, emotionally you know, mature and developed. It's interesting, so at the very, very end of her life, she was going blind and we tried to get her into a home mm. and she fought tooth and nail that she would not be removed from it. And it's just dawned on me that there was no way that she was going back into an institution. And yes. She ended up dying probably in the, in the house. It's an awful lot to take in and digest, and it just goes to show that, you know, the backgrounds um, that our parents have shape us as the, the people that we are. And, uh, and my mother was, uh, was, was, was tough, and I think she had to be to survive what she survived. And I look at it in a very different light now. I think there was quite a, a taint, is probably the word that was sometimes used about having been in the workhouse. You really came from the gutter, I think you would probably say, was the view a lot of people would have had. So having been in the workhouse carried a stigma, really, that for many people would last the rest of their lives and, and just would not be mentioned to anybody, um, certainly not family members. Um, and it was really a burden, uh, I think, for many people um, to, to carry that for the rest of their lives. The emotional barriers felt between Frances and her family still remain today. But there is hope that things will finally change. I think considering what my mother had probably been through, there's an awful lot to take on board and be very painful, I think. Um, I'm leaving it open-ended. I'm, I'm just going to reflect on everything and see where that takes me. You know, if he wanted to come over here and see me or meet me somewhere, I would um, like to see him again. He is my brother. If you would like advice about building your family tree or making a will, go to bbc.co.uk. There's sun, sand and affordable housing, but what about a job? The Hagues get a taste of Australian life next. Then from obsolete to occupied, more of Britain's empty homes are brought back to use. That's at 11 o'clock here on BBC One Scotland.